So welcome everybody to this evening's symposium and it's a great personal pleasure and a delight to welcome Philip Schofield to give this evening's paper. Philip is possibly the person to go to if you have any queries on any aspect of Benson and he's not only contributed through his own re research on Benson but also as the general editor of Benson's works. Uh, overseeing what is fast becoming an authoritative correction of at least part of the manuscripts that have still been unearthed and transcribed. But also, significantly, uh, Philip has personally edited some texts and brought them to a new lease of life and given us a, a clearer grasp of the basics of Benson's thought. He's Joining us from University College London, where he's the Professor of the History of Legal and Political Thought and directs the Bentham Project. So, Philip, much happiness awaits us, I'm sure. <laughs> I hope there's not too much pain. Um, but thank you for that introduction, Andrew, and um, thank you for the invitation to speak um, here at the um, Symposium in Legal Theory. And, um, it's um, a, a real pleasure to be here. And my paper is entitled The Epicurean Universe of Jeremy Bentham, Taste, Beauty and Reality. I should explain that at UCL last year we had um, a series of seminars on the subject of Bentham and the arts. And to many people this would sound like a contradiction in terms. But we recently published um, for, for the first time in authoritative form in the collected works of Jeremy Bentham, the volume entitled Of Sexual Irregularities. And also a volume on a similar theme online, um, which was the third volume of Not Paul But Jesus. This is where Bentham contrasts the um, views of Paul with those of Jesus. He sees Paul as ascetic and Jesus as more of an Epicurean. And so we asked various people to um, use these as their standard texts coming from different disciplines and to give us a paper on um, Bentham and their particular um, interests. And so um, this paper started out as part of that series and it's really an introduction to the series so that hopefully the rest of the papers in the book will, will make some sense and that's why it sort of focuses on this idea of, of taste but underpinning um, Bentham's views on taste is also, are also uh, the views that underpin his views on, on law and legal philosophy. Um, so I going to start um, ref with a reference to Marcel Duchamp's fountain. This is the upside down urinal which Duchamp possibly, possibly not exhibited in New York in 1917 and often is stated to be the most famous artwork of the 20th century. And the point here is that in talking about fountain, Marcel Duchamp said that the point of it was to show that there is no such thing as taste, whether good taste or bad taste. And Bentham was also well known to be critical of the notion of taste. And um, John Stuart Mill, for instance, tells us that Bentham could not bear to hear taste, the idea of good taste being mentioned in his presence. And so Bentham had philosophical grounds for his point of view, and that's what I've tried to explain in this paper. And so if, if you have a copy of the paper, I'm going to start part way down the first page, where I say perhaps the most significant moment in Bentham's life came as early as 1764, when at the age of 16, he was required to subscribe to the 39 Articles of the Church of England in order to take his Bachelor of Arts degree at the University of Oxford. Fifty years later, in a work entitled Church of Englandism, reflecting on his subscription, he admitted that he still felt shame at the sin of his boyhood, 
and that confessing his disbelief was, in the 39 articles, was an expiation, an atonement for that early sin. Bentham explained that he had his doubts about the truth of the articles. Together with some other students, he was sent to a fellow of his college, it was Queen's College, whose role was to assuage such doubts. But this fellow told them that it was not for uninformed youths such as them to presume to set up their private judgments against a public one formed by some of the holiest as well as best and wisest men that ever lived. In the end, Bentham subscribed because he didn't want to disappoint his father, who had earmarked him for a career in the law in the hope that he would rise to its very eminence as Lord Chancellor of England. It's remarkable, given his background, that Bentham had any doubts at all. Both of his grandmother's fathers had been Church of England clergymen. His father, himself a staunch Church of England man, was a lawyer in the City of London who had acquired an extensive property portfolio and had bought a house in Queen Square Place, Westminster, with an enormous garden. It's now um, the ministry where the Ministry of Justice in London now sits. Um, adjacent to St James's Park, he had his own entrance to St James's Park, and Jeremy eventually inherited it on his father's death in 1792. At the age of seven, Jeremy was sent to Westminster School, where he wrote devotional Latin verses on Christ's passion. At 12, he was sent to the Tory University of Oxford, where he dutifully attended his classes and translated Cicero's Tusculan Disputations at the command of his father. He was therefore immersed into the culture of a politically conservative, religiously orthodox and financially privileged upper middle class and by all expectations upwardly mobile metropolitan family and his stepbrother did eventually become a peer of the realm. So how could young Jeremy by the age of 16 have become sceptical about religion and resent for the rest of his life being forced to subscribe to the 39 articles. Now there's a hint in his translation of the Tusculan Disputations that not everything, borrowing a phrase here from Blackstone, that not everything is as it should be. To the passage which, he, which Jeremy had translated as, for though Plato were to give no reason for his assertions, see what deference I pay him, he would even burn me down by his authority. Young Jeremy added a footnote for his father. Note well, a very poor reason truly, that Tully should believe anything that Plato said merely because he said it is, in my opinion, as absurd as if I were to believe the soul was mortal merely because you said it. Or, as he might have phrased it, if I were to believe the soul was immortal, now, one wonders whether the comment raised concerns in Jeremiah's mind about his son's orthodoxy. Bentham, of course, is noted for his utilitarianism. But if we are to accept his word on this, he did not formulate his version of the principle of utility until 1769. Hence, his unwillingness to subscribe to the 39 articles could not have been based upon any explicitly utilitarian consideration. His unwillingness arose from doubts about the truth of the articles, and his resentment concerned the compromise, as he saw it, of his intellectual integrity, being forced to lie. The point is confirmed by the fact that Bentham tells us that when attending William Blackstone's lectures in 1764 at Oxford, he had been concerned about the fictions, in other words, the lies, the untruths, that he had detected in Blackstone's account of the uh, English law. The question therefore turns on the young Jeremy's Bentham's understanding of truth. While we have no account of his views on this question, there are, at the least at this age, there are plausible grounds for reading back his view of truth from his later writings on ontology and epistemology in order to appreciate the nature of his doubts about the 39 articles. Now having said that, we don't need to read back too far, not too many years. Although his most detailed writings on these subjects date from much later the 1810s, he had formulated his essential ideas by the early to mid 1770s. 
Now, in short, he argued that the only thing that had any real existence was the substance that formed the physical universe. But any proposition that made any claim grounded ultimately on a non-physical entity was, strictly speaking, nonsensical, and that any claim that misrepresented events or states of affairs in the physical world was untrue. Now, he presumably held this view by the time that he was compelled, as he saw it, to subscribe to the 39 Articles. Now, before discussing this theme in detail, his ontology and epistemology, I'll investigate Bentham's assimilation of Epicureanism and describe why it's important through a consideration of a recent book by Michel Onfray. It seems likely that Bentham had been attracted to Epicureanism through the account, albeit not a sympathetic one, he had found in Cicero's Tusculan Disputations. It's worth remembering that he had always been a voracious reader, and so he may have gone on to study more recent and contemporary writers who belong to the Epicurean tradition. Given what Bentham says later about his formative influences, one of these Epicurean writers, and perhaps the most important, was the French materialist philosopher Claude Adrien Helvetius. There's no evidence, however, that Bentham had read Helvetius's De l'Esprit before subscribing to the 39 Articles. According to Bentham's later reminiscences, which are not always totally reliable, he says that a copy fell into his hands when he was aged 20. Now, at some point, he read Lucretius's On the Nature of Things, which contains the most detailed surviving account of Epicurus's philosophy. One might speculate that it was his profound fear of ghosts, which, instilled, which was instilled into him at a young age by mischievous servants, that made a materialist account of the universe so attractive to him. If all that existed was a physical world, there were no spirits and then no ghosts of which to be afraid. He had to be moved, for instance, from his room at Oxford because it was overlooking a graveyard, and this gave him nightmares. There's no doubt that Bentham explicitly allied himself with the Epicurean tradition in opposition to the nonsense that he regarded as emanating from Plato and the Stoics. In an early manuscript from the mid-1770s, Bentham noted that he had the principle of utility from Epicurus, from Carniades, from Horace, from Helvetius, from Beccaria. In 1818, Bentham gave the title The Epicureans, the only philosophers deserving of the name to a proposed section of Not Paul But Jesus, Volume 3. And he began the section as follows. From the days of their founders to the present, Epicurus and those who have discoursed and acted, as he is said to have acted, constitute a standing butt to the invectives of hypocrisy and imbecility, whether clothed in the mantle of philosophy or that of religion. They have, in a word, been so many utilitarians, or rather non-ascetics. Nowhere have they looked for happiness, but where it was to be found. Where they looked for it, of course, was in pleasure. In a similar vein, in a note at the head of a manuscript written for the same essay, he wrote, Limitations to the pursuit of pleasure are those dictated by one prudence, two probity, three benevolence, conceded to her this Epicureanism, but Stoicism is that of the folly or hypocrisy. In Deontology, his extensive work on ethics dating from the mid-1810s, at the start of a chapter discussing the summum bonum of the ancient philosophers, Bentham noted summum bonum consummate nonsense, and anti-Epicureans quarrelers with their bread and butter. The problem was that neither Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, nor any of their disciples, nor the Stoics, having rejected pleasure, to do, could agree what the summum bonum consisted in, or even say anything intelligible about it. Going on to condemn Socrates and Plato for talking nonsense on pretense of teaching morality and wisdom, he described how they considered that the people in general, who were content with reaping pleasures under the guidance of common sense, were for that very reason considered as ignorant and as composing the vulgar herd. If the Platonists and Stoics were wrong, how must it have been, asked Bentham ironically, with those sensualists, with those hogs, the Epicureans? <laughs> 
According to the accounting ethicase compendium in Usum Juventutis Academicae, which was the elementary textbook on moral philosophy used by undergraduates at Oxford, and which Bentham himself has studied, the Epicureans, he noted, hogs as they were, had looked for the summum bonum in bodily pleasure. Bentham doubted, however, whether the Epicureans had looked for a summum bonum at all, whether they believed in the existence of such a thing, and whether, in their account of pleasure, pleasure in every shape that was not bodily should have been omitted. The Epicureans, he continued, could not have been unaware, since everyone knew it, that some pleasures had their seat in the mind, while others had their seat in the body. The author of the Epicure's Compendium had gone on to criticise the bodily pleasures on the grounds that they were ignoble, <coughs> short and unsavoury, and in this latter case gave rise to blushes. Bentham pointed out that the term ignoble meant nothing, and, any, and in any case it was the mind that felt pleasure, whatever its seat and not the body. If a pleasure was indeed of short duration, he asked, what did that matter? And finally, if the recollection of a pleasure taken in an improper manner led to an unsavoury recollection, what did that matter for a pleasure taken in a proper manner? So whether Bentham was inspired by Epicurus or some other sceptical writer, the moment when his scruples as a 16-year-old boy were brushed aside by the combined might of the University of Oxford and the Church of England, seconded by the considerable weight of paternal authority, was arguably not only a seminal moment in his own life, but also a seminal moment in the history of Western philosophy and in the history of aesthetics. The work of contemporary French philosopher Michel Onfray illustrates what's at stake. In his recent book, The Hedonist Manifesto, Onfray characterises the overwhelmingly dominant philosophical tradition in Western civilization as Platonic, Christian and Kantian. This tradition, accepted by the majority of contemporary philosophers, is characterised by the acceptance and celebration of a non-materialist universe that is superior to the physical universe which our bodies inhabit. Plato has his forms, Christianity its God, Kant his ideals. A dualism is positive between the material and the ideal, the body and the spirit, phenomena and noumena, the descriptive and the prescriptive, with the latter elevated over the former. In short, Platonism, Christianity and Kantianism all posit a metaphysics that ascribes superiority to the ideal domain over the physical, to the otherworldly over the thisworldly, to the spirit over the body. Those Epicurean philosophers who have opposed a dominant tradition, including Bentham and John Stuart Mill, are branded as pigs. Yet their concern, states Onfray, was to deconstruct myths, to get rid of gods, to provide solutions for the actual world, and to value pleasure and the common good. In relation to art and aesthetics, Onfray argues that Marcel Duchamp's fountain was the point at which the dominant approach was exposed as nonsense. That metaphysical urinal demolished Kant's critique of practical reason and thus Platonism in art and elsewhere. More than 20 centuries of classical theory about beauty went up in smoke in the blink of an eye, says Ampere. All of a sudden, beauty itself goes away and we believe that the audience constructs art. Now, at the climax of Ampere's book, where, having rejected the dominant Kantian worldview, he advocates the revolutionary transformation of individuals. There's the following remarkable passage. Marx and Foucault, he says, who, by the way, Onfray admires, did much to damage Anglo-Saxon utilitarianism. First, they harmed it for reasons surrounding the intellectual and political power struggles of their time. Second, they harmed it by promoting excessive specialisation, Foucault's sole focus on the panopticon, without concern for the project's totality, inspired him to write foolish things about Bentham. Hedonist utilitarianism is much more than a grossest philosophy or the invention of modern totalitarianism. It's a funny kind of grosser, continues Onfray, 
who pushes for the decriminalisation of homosexuality, the rights of minorities, women and children, a dignified status for animals who were cruelly tortured as if by executioners, and the humanisation of the conditions of incarceration in Panopticon. The supposed inventor of totalitarianism, i.e. Bentham, also wrote a catalogue of the crimes committed by religion and called out the hypocrisy of politicians. In deontology, he subordinated politics to ethics. All hedonist politics is concerned with the greatest good for the greatest number. The goal remains valid. Now, while some of the detail in this passage might be revised and possibly a great deal added, Onfray has appreciated the radical challenge that Benthamism entails to the dominant world's view. I now have a section on Cathy Gear's book, Pain, Pleasure and the Greater Good, which takes a totally opposite view, um, again linking Bentham to Epicureanism, Epicureanism but taking the side of Kant, linking Bentham to modern totalitarianism in the realm of medical ethics. But I'm going to um, miss out that um, section, go on to page 13 and talk about and go to the, the section headed uh, Bentham's critique of metaphysics. Now I've suggested above that Bentham found Epicureanism attractive because of its materialism, its rejection of any form of metaphysics. It's important then to explore how Bentham presented his own views in this respect in order to appreciate why he would have rejected any claim concerning the existence of a metaphysics of beauty, whatever form that metaphysics took, whether as a mathematical proportion and symmetry, a set of ideal forms, or an inherent sense of the sublime and the beautiful, akin to the notion of the moral sense. So this brings us on to, or back to, Bentham's ontology and epistemology. There's a section where I talk about the confusion in Bentham's scholarship between fictitious entities and fictions, which um, we don't need to know about. So we move on to page 16, and the bottom of page 16, where I start talking about Bentham's essay on logic. In an um, essay on logic, this was written um, around 1830, 1814, Bentham explained that the source of perception, and it might be added the only source, was an individual portion of matter, a real corporeal entity, a body, by which an impression was made on sense. Strictly speaking, these impressions were the immediate source of perception, and the body itself but the secondary and comparatively remote source. The existence of the object of perception was therefore a subject of inference rather than of perception, and such inference was frequently found to be erroneous. We heard a sound, for instance, and assumed it was raining, but when we look out of the window, we find that the wind was rustling the leaves in a tree. So, um, I talk about perceiving this table, um, but what I actually perceive is not the table, but my perceptions. So Bentham describes a two-stage process by which the mind, or more specifically the perceptive faculty, experiences the physical universe. At the first stage, the physical object gave rise to an impression in the organs of perception, and at the second stage, the impression was recognised by the perceptive faculty in the mind. Knowledge of the physical world was inferential because what we perceived were impressions and not the objects themselves. There were therefore two different but related notions which Bentham termed perceptible real entities. The first were our own perceptions, whether impressions produced by the application of sensible objects to the organs of sense, or ideas brought to view by the recollection of this, these same objects, and this ideas impression distinction that Bentham explicitly follows David Hume. The second group were bodies of all sorts. Again, he explained that ideas, and he presumably meant impressions and ideas, were in fact the sole perceptible entities, while corporeal substances were inferential. He went on, however, to make a second distinction which also involved inference, namely a distinction within 
real entities between perceptible and inferential entities. The former being those of, the, of, whose, of whose existence we were persuaded directly through perception, and the latter those of whose existence we were persuaded by a process of reasoning or reflection. If one were referring only to substances, the term perceptible real entities should be applied to corporal substances and inferential to incorporeal ones. That is to such inferential because imperceptible entities as the human soul, God, angels and devils. The soundness of the inference from perceptions to the existence of the corporeal body of which it was a perception was far stronger, he argued, than that from the existence of corporeal to that of incorporeal substances. So my inference that this table exists is much stronger than any inference I can make that an angel exists. And to quote Bentham, suppose the non-existence of corporeal substances, of any hard corporeal substance that stands opposite to you. Make this supposition, and as soon as you have made it, act upon it, pain, the perception of pain, will at once bear witness against you and be your punishment, your condign punishment. Suppose the non-existence of the above-mentioned inferential corporeal substances, of any of them or all of them, and the supposition made, act upon it accordingly, be the supposition conformable or not conformable to the truth of the case, at any rate, no such immediate counter-evidence, no such immediate punishment will follow. I try, if I try and walk through that wall because I don't believe it's there, I will hurt myself. If I say God doesn't exist, I'm still waiting for the thunderbolt. So inferential real entities such as the human soul and God had never been perceived and their reality cannot therefore be considered otherwise than as a matter of inference. If one were not persuaded of the inference, that is that the human soul or God were real entities, it was likely that one would assign the former to the class of fictitious entities consisting of the aggregate of such psychical entities as were said to compose the mind and the latter to the class of non-entities. I'll talk about fictitious entities in a moment. To summarise, there were two inferences. The first from perceptions to substances. The second from substances perceived to substances unperceived. For Bentham, to assume the physical non-existence of entities that reveal themselves to us through sense perception would tend to produce evil consequences. Such evil consequences would not follow were we to assume the physical non-existence of entities that had not been perceived and possibly were not perceivable. The individual bodies that we did perceive and could be assumed to our physical existence were real entities. Now, Bentham referred to real entities, fictitious entities, and also fabulous entities and non-entities. Now, the basic distinction to which all other entities had to be referred, it seems, was that between real and fictitious entities. Real entities, fictitious entities, Bentham says, under one or other of these denominations may be comprehended every object that ever was or can be present to any faculty of the human frame, to perception, memory or imagination. Bentham recognised that the term fictitious entity seemed to involve a contradiction in that the term entity suggested that the thing represented had existence, while the term fictitious suggested that it did not. Why then not use the term non-entity? Well, Bentham answered that the root of the contradiction lay in language. That instrument without which, he says, though of itself it is nothing, nothing can be said and scarce anything can be done. Hence, while fictitious entities did not exist, the names of fictitious entities did exist. Sounds and written words, after all, are perceptible. To language, then, he says, to language alone, to this that it is that fictitious entities or their existence, their impossible yet indispensable existence. So every name that existed in a language, he presumably meant that every name that would potentially make sense when placed in a proposition, every such name was either the name of a real entity or the name of a fictitious entity. 
We will more, what more will moreover be seen is that the fiction, the mode of representation by which the fictitious entities thus created, insofar as fictitious entities can be created, are dressed up in the garb and placed upon the level of real ones, is a contrivance but for which language, or at any rate language in any form superior to that of the language of the brute creation, could not have existence. It's important to note that Bentham refers to the fiction involved in the creation of fictitious entities and not that fictitious entities were fictions. A fiction was a lie, but the fiction here consisted in the apparent predication of real existence to the subject represented by the name of a fictitious entity. So what I, I haven't explained uh, and should have done in the section I missed out was that a fictitious entity is an abstract word what we would think of in an abstract word. And in other words, to, con to claim the subject so represented by a fictitious entity of physical existence would be a falsehood. But unless we spoke as though it did have, it, have existence, our language would not rise above that of animals, and since thought was dependent on language, our thought would not rise above that of animals either. Bentham explained that names were first applied to real entities and thereby an association formed between the name and the reality of the object to which it was assigned. There was there then had arisen a very natural propensity to ascribe reality to every object given a name, including fictitious entities. So the confusion is thinking that every known substantive stands for a real object. I'm going to skip um, a paragraph and move to the middle of page 21. I'm skipping my explanation of fabulous entities and non-entities. So how did Bentham make sense of fictitious entities with their necessary but merely linguistic existence? Now as he pointed out in law, which was a, of course his main philosophical and practical concern, many of the leading terms such as right, duty, obligation and power did not correspond to any physical thing. And these were names of fictitious entities. And similarly, words such as matter, form, quantity, quality, relation, place, time, motion, and action, together with their related ideas, all designated fictitious entities. They were like terms in algebra, which were used as shorthand to represent more complex entities. Such terms and names of fictitious entities made sense insofar as they could be expounded by showing their connection with real entities, objects that existed in the physical world. See where we're going with Bentham's materialism. One took a proposition which contained the name of a fictitious entity and reformulated it in a proposition that had the same meaning but contained only the names of real entities or were closer to real entities. One might say, for instance, that a person enjoyed liberty when he had the capacity to move his limbs without impediment, wherein the idea of motion or movement was a step closer to the physical world than the idea of liberty. Bentham gave the name paraphrasis to this process of demonstrating the relationship of the names of fictitious entities or abstract terms to real entities or objects that had physical existence. Insofar as this operation could be successfully carried out, the proposition containing the abstract term made sense. Insofar as there existed no physical root for the abstract term, the proposition in which it was contained made no sense. Hence, it made sense to talk about a legal right where it was possible to identify the legislator who had commanded its creation and enforcement. Where whereas it made no sense to talk about a natural right, because there was no such legislator. In short, the name of a fictitious entity did not represent an object that had physical existence, but it facilitated discourse to speak of it as though it did exist. It made sense to say that a certain person lay under an obligation to another person or enjoyed a right, but no one had ever seen, heard, touched, tasted, smelled, or, assuming a sixth sense, had sex with an obligation or a right. A proposition, including the term obligation, 
um, or the term right would make sense if it could be expounded by paraphrasis. That is, if it could be translated into another proposition with the same import, but which contained only real entities. According to Bentham, the only source of knowledge was sense perception. The only source from which sense perception could be derived was the physical substance of the universe. There were no innate ideas. To the objection made by Platonists and Kantians that we must have the innate idea of a perfect circle in order to recognise that a particular geometric shape is a circle, Bentham responded, or would have responded, that there's no such thing in the physical universe as a, phys as a perfect circle. That the only place that a perfect circle exists is in the imagination, and that the idea is created by the mind's power of abstraction based on all the imperfect circles that we have encountered in the physical world. Similarly, the proposition 1 plus 1 equals 2 would be in itself totally meaningless for Bentham. There is no innate mathematics in the mind. The sum 1 plus 1 equals 2 is an abstraction, perhaps derived from the experience of taking an apple, then taking another apple, placing them next to each other, and calling the resulting situation two apples. The proposition only makes sense when it is related to objects in the physical world. When, in his account of paraphrasis, Bentham referred to the fictitious proposition that an obligation is incumbent on a man, he did not mean that this pro proposition was a legal fiction or any other sort of fiction. It might, of course, have been false to state that, in a certain situation, a certain person lay under a legal obligation, but equally it might have been true. A fiction was a lie, but a proposition concerning a fictitious entity or several fictitious entities might be true. A true fiction was a contradiction in terms. So now we're in a position, I hope, to see why Bentham took the view that talk about any notion of the sublime or the beautiful that was based on some form of metaphysics, in other words, appealed to some non-physical quality, was so much nonsense. If the proposition that some entity was beautiful were to make sense, the notion of beautiful had to be expounded by the process of paraphrasis, and thus be shown to have its root in real entities. In the end, for me to say that something was beautiful was to say nothing more than that I liked the thing. And to say that I liked that thing was to say that it gave me pleasure. Conversely, for me to say that something was ugly only made sense if it meant that the thing in question gave me pain. Feelings of pleasure and pain were real entities. Bentham's position becomes clear when we consider his threefold division of moral theories into the principle of utility, the principle of asceticism, and the principle of sympathy and antipathy, or of caprice. An adherent of the principle of utility, noted Bentham, approves or disapproves of every action whatsoever according to the tendency which it appears to have to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interest is in question, where happiness was understood as a balance of pleasure over pain. To talk about the principle of utility made sense because it was founded on the real entities of pleasure and pain. All rival theories which were necessarily wrong if the principle of utility were right fell into two groups. The first group, which consisted in variance of the principle of asceticism, <coughs> was constantly opposed to the principle of utility, while the second, which consisted in variance of the principle of sympathy and antipathy, was sometimes opposed to it and sometimes not. The adherent of the principle of asceticism approves or disapproves of any action according to the tendency which it appears to have to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interest is in question but in an inverse manner to the principle of utility, <coughs> approving of actions in as far as they tend to diminish his happiness, disapproving of them as far, in as far as they tend to augment it. And Bentham gave the example of certain religionists and the Stoics as um, adherence up to a point of the principle of asceticism. Well, the, the adherent of the principle of sympathy and antipathy approved or disapproved of actions, neither on account of their tendency to increase nor on account of their tendency to decrease the happiness of the persons affected by them, but merely because a man finds himself disposed to approve or disapprove of them, holding up that approbation or disapprobation 
as a, sufficient, as a sufficient reason for itself and disclaiming the necessity of looking out for any extrinsic ground. The amount of punishment that the adherent of the principle of sympathy and antipathy attached to any action was measured by the degree of his dislike. If you hate much, punish much. If you hate little, punish little. Punish as you hate. If you hate not at all, punish not at all. The fine feelings of the soul are not to be overborne by the harsh and rugged dictates of political utility. I wonder whether there's a mistranscription in the, um, from the manuscript there, whether Ben should have said practical utility, or whether he actually wrote practical utility. Um, anyway, all so-called standards of right and wrong, apart from the principles of utility and asceticism, were in fact reducible to the principle of sympathy and antipathy. The point was that by dressing up his own opinions or sentiments in the garb of some fictional standard, whether termed the moral sense, common sense, the law of nature, right reason, or repugnancy to nature, the adherent of the principle of sympathy and antipathy attempted both to avoid the obligation of appealing to any external standard and to persuade others to take his own sentiments as an authoritative standard. The notion of repugnancy to nature was a particular aspect of the principle of sympathy and antipathy that Bentham criticised in his later writings on sexual morality. But he had made the same point, um, as he noted, in his um, Introduction to Principles and Morals and Legislation, from which I've just been quoting. Bentham there explained that acts such as the exposing of children by the Greeks and Romans were often condemned upon the principle of antipathy for being unnatural. But all that unnatural meant, if it meant anything, was unfrequent. However, the complaint was usually that the act was all too frequent. The term unnatural expressed nothing but the disposition of the person who is talking of it, the disposition he is in to be angry at the thoughts of it. The person who claimed that an act was unnatural was in fact saying that he did not like to practice it and therefore it should not be practiced by others. There was no difference in taste, says Bentham, and no difference in opinion from which the adherent of the principle of sympathy and antipathy might not extract a ground of punishment. We can see now uh, that to say, I like this or I like that, was to be an adherent of the principle of sympathy and antipathy. At least where you tried to impose those likes on others. Taste was capricious. And herein lay Bentham's opposition to the notion of taste. Insofar as those who referred to taste were appealing or pretending to appeal to some metaphysical standard, they were talking nonsense. What they were in fact doing was making a claim that their own opinions were superior to those of others. This was as much as to say that their pleasure was more important than any other person's pleasure, or perhaps that the pleasure of persons of their social class persons who shared a similar place in the conjunct scales of power, opulence and factitious dignity, were superior to those of another social class. This, moreover, was the claim of the highest class, the aristocracy, and they had the advantage that their wealth and power could be used to make their claim appear plausible and even accepted by their inferiors in power, wealth and titles. Bentham remarked that the democratical section of the community refers or soon will refer everything to the standard of utility. The aristocratical to as great an extent and as long as possible to the standard of taste, itself being the arbiter of taste. The adherent of the principle of utility had no basis for claiming that the pleasure of one person was much more than the equal pleasure of any other person, and hence ruled out all claims based on superiority of taste. It might be objected that the person of taste, when thinking of an object or action of which he disapproved, experienced pain as a result, and hence, the pain should be and hence that pain should be taken into account by the adherent of the principle of utility. Moreover, if the pain was sufficiently intense or experienced by a sufficiently large number of people, then the adherent of the principle of utility should condemn the object or action in question. Bentham's response would be that the problem did not lie in the object or action complained about, but in the attitude, often founded in prejudice, 
of the observer. And I go on to explain that um, in the next paragraph. So Bentham at one point was particularly concerned about, as I've mentioned, um, sexual irregularities. And um, he wrote a defense of sexual liberty, and in particular, same male um, same-sex relationships. And, say an observer or someone thinking about male same-sex relationships found this repugnant, repugnant, that gave them pain. Bentham's claim was that pain was founded on prejudice. If you stop the activity, you stop the pleasure. Um, but um, if, on the other hand, you took away the prejudice, you took away the, 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 the pain, and you also kept the pleasure. So on a utility calculation, the thing to do was remove the prejudice, not stop the action, which um, you didn't like. So I move to my summary, um, my penultimate page. You'll be relieved to know. In summary, there was no independent value of beauty to which the person of taste could claim privileged access. All that taste reflected was the pleasure that one gained from a particular thing or state of things. Once this was recognised, since no one person's pleasure was more important than that of another person's equal pleasure, no one person's taste could be regarded as that as being superior to that of any other person's. Michel Onfray, as we have seen, argues that fountain was the critical turning point in the history of aesthetics. Alternatively, it might be argued that the critical turning point arrived over 150 years earlier, in 1764, when a 16-year-old boy had been forced to subscribe to the 39 Articles of the Church of England. It took Bentham many years and many projects to work through the implications of the materialist worldview that he had adopted, including a radical scepticism towards the metaphysics that had hitherto dominated the history of ideas. But as he did so, established institutions and practices in law, religion, politics and economics became the subject of his ferocious criticism and the systems of thought on which they rested were demolished. Bentham's utilitarianism brought the radical Epicurean tradition into the mainstream, but only briefly. John Stuart Mill, who was Bentham's most influential successor in the utilitarian tradition, while not rejecting his Epicurean legacy, began the retreat from outright, outright materialism back towards metaphysics through his condemnation of Bentham's critique of taste and with his distinction between higher and lower pleasures and his associated claim that it was better to be a human being satisfied than a pig satisfied, better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. But as Michel Onfray suggests, there are, however, good reasons to think about reviving Bentham's Epicurean project. Thank you very much.